Thank you very much for inviting me, and also since this is the last talk, I would like to thank the organizers of this wonderful, wonderful event on behalf of all the participants. So this is our joint work with uh, Misha Kalanov. It's, it's pretty small. Can you, do you think you can make the text larger? I'll make it larger. Oh. Yes, I can do it larger. If, uh, yes, I can. Oh, that's perfect. Okay, then, then there will be complicated. Um, so, uh, it took us, uh, I think, about five years to complete it, but God willing, it will be written up shortly. So, otherwise, Misha wouldn't permit, the proofs have to be there. So, uh, the SU2, or any, for any other compact league group, there is the wittenrich tick derived invariant, which is an invariant of a link inside a manifold, and this invariant depends on an integer number r, which is called level, and the invariant itself is a complex number. So since it's just a complex number, at least in the most naive approach, it's a challenging problem to categorify it, because how do you categorify a complex number? You should see Q inside it. So there are different approaches to express it in terms of Q, which is the 2R root of unity. But again, in general setup, it's a very complicated problem. However, uh, some manifolds have the following property. For any link inside this special manifold, there exists a polynomial <coughs> of a formal variable Q, the run polynomial, such that when the level is sufficiently large, the ratio of the invariant with the link over the invariant without the link is equal to, to this polynomial evaluated at the root of unity. So, the most famous example of this behavior, of, or of this manifold, is a sphere. And in that case, J is known as the Jones polynomial, of course. But there is a whole class of such manifolds. They're very simple. You can construct them, for example, by taking three-dimensional sphere and cutting out an even number of three-dimensional balls and gluing their boundaries pairwise. Or you could construct them by doing zero surgeries on a number of totally disjoint unlinks, unknots uh, sitting inside S3. Would be the same thing. <coughs> so we will study the case when you make two holes and glue their boundaries together, so you get S2 press S1. So we want to study and categorify this polynomial for S2 process 1 and construct the corresponding stable wittenrich sticking categorification of the corresponding stable toy wittenrich sticking derived invariant. So let me give a quick and dirty exposition in case I don't have enough time to present the whole story. So let's use the following notation. We'll be using this simple uh, torus gray which corresponds to taking n, or in, in this case we need, let's assume that the number of strands is even, so it's two n strands, and you turn them by 360, and then you add extra framing twists on each strand. By the way, everything is framed in today's talk. All the links, all the tangles, everything is framed. So then you compose them, put them one on top of the other n times, and this is my shortcut notation for this. So this is a torus braid with twist number n. And so, if you have a link in S2 press S1, then the, this stable wittenrich tick and drive invariant can be computed in the following way. So you present the link as a closure of a tangle sitting inside S2 press S1, and this is 
a picture of S2 process 1. Now you take the same tangle, put it inside S3, close it with the help of this braid with very high twist, and compute the Kaufman bracket, or the Jones polynomial, of the resulting link. And this will be, in fact, this thing will be polynomial in Q. I will run polynomial. <coughs> Actually, when, when twist goes to infinity, it will be power series in Q. So it will be Laurent power series. And this power series represents the invariant. How do you categorify it? Obviously, you compute Kvanov's homology for the same setup. So, what does it mean that there, there, so obviously we assume that there is a limit when n goes to infinity. So let me give you a picture of what goes on. So if you present Kovanov homology of this link as a table, so let's say here you have negative homological degree, and here you have the Q degree. Then you will see that Well, you will see the following. You will see a cloud, so the non-zero homology will be concentrated in a certain region, which roughly has the shape of a parallelogram, with the slope 1, with the slope 2, slope 2, and slope 1. And this endpoint has coordinates, let me write it as this, 2n n times n comma n plus 1. So it's this vector times 2n n. So I just took out common factor. So it will not be this perfect parallelogram, but the cloud will be roughly distributed like this. And then as n goes up, the parallelogram will extend. Of course. But you will notice that the dimensions of homologies that appear here, they stabilize. So as n goes up, these numbers remain the same. And by the way, the same phenomenon will happen here, only you'll have to translate this up there. But this is a separate story. No, no. There will be one big cloud. No, there is no... It will be just that these numbers will stay the same as n grows up. And these numbers will also stay the same, but you will have to translate them up there to see that, or change the framing convention so that this point will remain the same and that thing will grow down. So, but again, this is a separate story. Oh, little n is. We, uh, we have a tangle on two n strands, sorry. Could you, could you tell us some, um, like for the, if I took the two n torus on its own? Uh, yes, I'll talk about this at the very end, so if I get there. But I should say that, th thank you actually for reminding me about this, if tau is identity braid, then this stabilization was uh, first observed by Josef Przetinsky, for the case of n equal to 1, and was observed by Markus Tosic for general n. So they observed that these parts are stabilizing, and I think Marco also provided the proof for torus uh, links why they would that they would stabilize. And, say. and also uh, Yosef related this stable part in torus not to Haschel homology of uh, Misha's uh, first algebra C of x mod x squared, and this will appear here too. So, what is a, again, quick and dirty explanation for what, what goes on? So, why would, this, why would this construction represent an invariant of the link? The same the same link inside S2 process 1 can be presented as closure of different tangles. So the main move 
which relates those angles, apart from the Markov move of moving stuff around, is inserting a certain braid inside. So if you take, consider this braid. This is 2n minus 1 strands going up, and one strand winding around them, and then you add two framing twists. So if you cut your tangle at some level, and insert this thing inside it, with the appropriate number of strands, it's always even, then the length that you get as a result will be the same length as you had initially. So, why would such insertion not change the quadratic complex? Or change it only up to homotopy? The explanation um, resides on two facts. First of all, this break by which we close the by which we close the tangle is a central element even with respect to tangles. So if you put this on top of a certain tangle, then you can certainly twist the whole thing and this braid will appear at the bottom. It will be twisting the incoming strands. So it has this powerful commutativity property and also it's kind of, it, it has a spell, it can be its categorification in the universal category, I will talk about it later, this is just a quick and dirty introduction, can be represented by a special complex such that in this from starting from the zero position all the way to minus 2n plus 1, and in all the positions of that complex up to this one, you will have only split tangles. Only split tangles. So Therefore, if you want to eliminate this braid sitting inside that tangled tau, which is being closed, you take this braid, use the commutativity, and you move it all the way up to this thing. And now when it appears on top of this thing, you simply unwind the unwelcome tangle. So first you move it on top to this, and then you unwind this construction through the gaps. Yeah, this is the idea. You have to prove certain things. You have to check what happens to the morphisms, to the differential, but the differential remains the same. But the idea is this. The complex has gaps. You use those gaps to unwind the moves that represent equivalence between tangles whose closure gives you the same length. So this is quick and dirty. Oh, we have to know. And then you use the Barnetton and his collaborators. They created wonderful software to compute uh, homology, so you plug this tau closed by braid in, and you get a lot of experimental information on those on, on that homology and its invariance. So now let's explain the whole thing conceptually. So first of all, let me remind you about Kaufman bracket. I use it in classical Kaufman's normalization. Well, you heard about it today, and remind you what is a tangle. It's a thing like this. We'll also use dual tangle, which is its mirror image with respect to this mirror. And we will be using, I call them temporal leap tangles, or TL tangles. These are planar, connected, meaning no, no disjoint circles, tangles like this. Among those, particularly important for us, will be tangles of, TL tangles of type 0 to n, which are also called crossingless patchings. So the temporal leap algebra is the algebra generated by temporal leap tangles. The multiplication is composition of those things. If a circle appears, you remove it and replace by this. And Kaufman bracket maps the semigroup of tangles into this temporal leap algebra because you, re you replace all the crossings according to Kaufman's bracket. And I will also use notation TLMN. That's the part of temporal leave algebra which is generated by tangles of type MN. By temporal leave tangles of type MN. So, we will need jones wenzel projectors. If you take the identity braid in temporal leave algebra of 2N, 2N tangles, if, if I put single 2N, this means 2N, 2N. Then, this 
this idea that it can be presented as a sum of mutually orthogonal idempotent elements, which I call P2N 2M. So this 2M refers to this, and this is their number. These correspond to, pre if, if you associate those tangles to invariant tensors in the tensor product of two-dimensional representations of quantum SU2, then these correspond to projecting the tensor product onto the sums of SU2 representations with given highest weight. So the most famous of those projectors, and it is usually referred to as John Svensson projector, is the projector 2N 2N. So it projects onto the highest weight representation in the tensor product of those V2s. But we will need the projection onto the zero spin representation. So it's the last one in this. Uh, oh, but by the way, they, they're, all, they're all central. All these projectors are central. So, this projector, if you, use, if you multiply elements of this algebra by it, it projects them onto a two-sided ideal generated by cut, or should I call them split? Maybe split is a better name. By split TL tangles. So it just takes out this out of a general uh, linear combination of TL tangles, which represents an element in here. And there is a simple explicit formula for this projector. Yes. Because th there is a pairing of tangles in, in, there is a pairing among crossingless matchings. You, you just connect them like this, one and the other, and compute the Kaufman bracket, meaning minus Q minus Q inverse to the number of circles in their closure in, uh, in, in this link. And you get a matrix between those crossingless matches. Take the inverse matrix, pair it with this, and this is your projector. This is a standard formula. How do you write a projector by using scalar product? So just a remark, the split TL tangles, 2N, 2N, that's just a tensor product of crossingless matchings and crossingless matchings upside down. So now, with this uh, background at hand, I will describe the toy stable wittenberg sticking to right theory, which covers these polynomials J that I mentioned at the very beginning. So how do you construct those polynomials? So to a two-sphere with two end marked points, you associate the space of crossingless matchings. Again, this is very standard. We're not, in, we're not inventing here anything. And it has this pairing. So if you have a tangle in a ball, to that, by all the rules, you have to associate an element here. So of course you will associate to it its Kaufman bracket. Because its Kaufman bracket will be exactly a linear combination of crossingless matches. What else can be there? So this is very standard thing. So far it's not stable yet. It's, uh, the, the, the thing is that, yes, if R is not high enough, then the actual space associated to a sphere with marked points will be a quotient of this. So, there is a map from this space to the actual space that you get in, uh, sorry, in Wittenberg's taken drive theory. It's a quotient. But if R is high enough, then there is an isomorphism. So it stabilizes. There, there are no, no relations associated to funny properties of quantum groups. Representation theory of quantum SL2, even at order of unity, becomes the same as the standard one if the level is high. So what do you associate to a sphere with two mark point? With, sorry, what do you associate to two spheres, one sitting inside the other? Of course, from the, inside in the picture, it's an abstract thing. So this is two S2s. You associate the cut temporally the algebra, which is the tensor product of spaces associated with spheres. Again, it's absolutely standard, and that's the stable limit of the standard theorem when R goes to infinity. So what do you associate to 
to a tangle sitting in S2 crosses segment. So these are the ends, the, the, these are the boundary S2s of this. So to that you associate a composition of this, of the Kaufman bracket of the tangle with this projector either on top or at the bottom. And indeed, when you compose this with the projector, you land in the tensor product of crossingless matchings times crossingless matchings. Because that's what the projector does. And again, this is a standard formula. So if you work with with stick and terrain in the setup, you will know this formula, and you will also know that it has to be modified when, when the level is not sufficiently high. Then you get some other projectors here. Okay, so let's give a quick explanation why this, I call it spherical Kaufman bracket, meaning Kaufman bracket composed with this, why is it well defined on tangles in here? So what's the difference between a tangle and a tangle in S2 cross 0, 1? We have to <coughs> trivialize these braids. As I, it's the same as in S2 cross S1. If you map tangles into tangles in S2 cross S1, then the kernel, in the right sense of this map from semigroup to, to this semigroup, will be generated by this and this. Well, the square of this lies in, uh, in the congruence. Well, let, let's forget about this for a moment. They're treated similarly. So, how do you explain that adding this braid in the middle of this tangle does not change its spherical Kaufman bracket? Just repeat the argument that I mentioned. It's the main argument of the whole talk. You move it to where this thing sits inside the tangle and unwind it by using the fact that projector has only split tangles inside it. Just move projector to the place where you inserted it in the tangle and then why. By the way, I, I'll, I'll mention it towards the end. This, this projector is the stable limit of the Kaufman bracket of an infinite braid. So if you compute Kaufman bracket of the infinite braid, this is what will appear here. So, if you have now a link in S2 process 1, how would you close? So, logically you close the strands, you get a link in S2 process 1, and then you have to turn this link into a polynomial here. So, you may do it through the Kaufman bracket. First, you compute the Kaufman bracket, the spherical Kaufman bracket, meaning you put the project on top, and then you close those strands within S3. In temporal linear algebra, you can close the upper and lower ends and get a link. So you get this link and compute its Kaufman bracket. And it's well defined. It's, uh, this Kaufman this bracket is well defined, meaning it does, not rep it does not depend on the choice of the tangle which represents this link. For example, if you have two tangles, which are composed, if you compose them in the opposite order, you get the same link. But in this computation, thanks to commutativity of, to this, commutativity of this projector, you can move it around and get the same invariant. So, so there's just a question. So yes. So that 2m, 2m tangle in S2 cross 0, 1, essentially associating Yes. Yes. Exactly. 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 Okay. So now we go into categorification. Uh, so this is uh, what I mentioned to Lou uh, a few days ago. So th this. Uh, I think, uh, I suggest that at 
least for working with tangles, it may be worthwhile to modify slightly the yes. So actually, um, building on his question, um, so so is it? Are you doing that because it's easiest, or are you doing it because the other executed components aren't going to give you invariance of the closure? Uh, others will not give you the invariance, and WRT invariant does exactly this. When R is high, then I'm just reproducing. I'm sorry. I'm reproducing the WRT. When R is not high, it's the same story, but there are some further quotients that you have to take. So it's, it's not because it's the easiest. So it's, it's a slight modification of classical Misha's uh, conventions about grading, uh, which I think is a bit more convenient when you work with tangles. So let me go very quickly over it. If you don't like it, then you may stick to classical conventions. So in this convention, you have you add an extra degree, which is of homological nature and is defined mod 2. So all these three degrees may be half integer, may take half integer values, but this Misha's homological degree and this one will become half integer simultaneously. So the total homological degree mod 2, which determines the signs, will remain integer. So all the formulas which involve signs will work fine. So the, uh, by the way, this convention comes straight from matrix factorizations. Matrix factorizations give you a very um, convenient picture. So the rules, so here are the modified rules. To an unknot, you associate what Misha associates with the shift, this is Misha's shift, and with degree 1 here. So you're not the space of the not is totally odd. It's a odd degree. And that's why a loose bracket is negative. And to a bracket, you associate this complex with few modifications related to the third degree. Now this complex is balanced, as you see. This, is, this shift is negative of that shift. And there will be framing dependence. By the way, my, uh, the, my, my convention for Kaufman bracket also involves framing dependence. It works only for framed links. So if you change the framing by one, this one stands for this kink. Then this will be the straight line with this shift in degrees. But that's, that's normal and this is how it should be. The advantage of this new grading is that you will get the invariant of second and third right wise removes for tangles and blinks and nice behavior under the first right wise remove without ever using orientation on links or tangles. So you never have to bother about orientation. In Misha's classical prescription, you compute the complex and then you shift it. And in order to find the numbers by which you shift the degrees, you have to introduce an orientation, do some, do some counting of crossings, and, and get that shift. The shift will not depend on the choice of orientation, but you still have to put it in. So it's a bit inconvenient, especially when you're dealing with tangles. So this, this prescription gets rid of it. Okay, so Barnetton introduced a universal category for tangles, uh, building on Misha's work, of course. Uh, so he starts with a formal additive category generated by TL tangles, so by pictures like this. And morphisms are planar cobordisms. I don't want to go into this, just think of the simplest cobordism, saddle and uh, some bubble creation, but I'm, I'm avoiding bubbles, so let's, let's think of cells. Modulo certain relations between those cobordisms, which he calls 4T relations. It's not essential since we do not go into lots of details. So he, the universal category is the category of, the homotopy category of complexes over this category. So you arrange now these pictures into complexes, and the differentials are cobordisms. And this is done up to homotopy. So the picture is this. Here you have tangles, the universal category. 
T0 turns this category into temporal Lieb algebra, exactly, because that one is formed by these. And the Kaufman bracket goes this way, categorification goes that way, and the whole thing is commutative. So here is an example, which explains how this funny, uh, funny third degree convention turns into classical Kaufman bracket. And just, just a quick comment, the, uh, we will be also using category of split tangles, which is the universal version, which is generated by split tangles. It's a cross product of category of uh, crossingless matchings up, up and down. So we'll also use this one. So this, is, this has already been explained here. So now, this piece was mentioned by Ellie, but a little bit. So it's, it's early Misha's work on categorifying tangles. He introduced a certain algebras. And today we'll be using algebra, which he called HM. And then I think he tried to rename it into A, but it was too late. So, so what is this algebra HM? It's the algebra of all the homes in the universal category of zero of crossingless matchings between all crossingless matchings. So it's an attempt to algebra an attempt at algebraization of the it's an attempt of algebraic categorification of tables. So he gets this algebra. Another way of uh, computing this home, it's just the command of homology of these two crossingless matchings joined together. So if you do not like, maybe it's, it's easier to, to imagine it this way. So how do you multiply elements of this algebra? So here is one piece of the algebra, which is gluing these crossingless matchings. Here is another one. And you have to explain multiplication as a homomorphism from tensor product into this. So this homomorphism is a composition of samples. Again, if you, if you use this picture, then there is nothing to explain. You compose hubs. But if you use measures classical picture, then you have to explain how you compose these closures. And you compose them through settles. So first you do the settle homomorphism on this pair of matching arcs. And then you do it on the second pair, and you get what you want. So again, this is standard stuff. So an F, oh, I should say 2M, 2M tangle. Sorry, that's a typo. 2M, 2M tangle. He turns them into, into complexes, up to homotopy, of H by modules. So here is what he does. He takes a tangle, and the corresponding complex, which I denote pictorially by using these um, square brackets, square red brackets on top of them, and at the bottom. It's just the notation of this. He takes all crossingless matchings of the appropriate size on top and at the bottom, closes it, and takes the Havada uh, homology, for the resulting link, and takes the direct sum. By the way, if your tangle is the identity frame, then the result will be the algebra itself. So tangles turn into bimodules. Uh, and he proves that the composition of tangles turns into a tensor product over HM. So this is a module over H, H. This is a module over H, H. It tends to over the intermediate one, and it corresponds to the closure. The problem with his construction was that you could not easily, at least, explain how to close a tangle within S3. You might think that you have to tense her over up and down, but you do not get the right answer. So that's why Barnetton was a certain improvement on top of this. Because in Barnetton's universal picture, you just simply close them, just, just draw the arcs that close the 
the ends of the tangle and you get the complex for the corresponding link in S3. So in his picture it was straightforward. So two M to N tangles can be universally categorified here or can be algebraically categorified there and there is a, an obvious functor from here to there which turns universal. The universal means that every categorification has to go through it. Okay, now comes the hard part. Um, we have to work with derived categories now. So, quick and dirty introduction as much as I know about derived categories. So, suppose you have an algebra R. And in our case, of course, it will be Hn, or Hn tends for Hm opposite. So what is this uh, category of uh, derived category, bounded derived category of, uh, of R modules? All its objects come from bounded complexes of R modules. So it's just a different way of treating objects here. And how do you treat them? You take a complex from here representing an object here and put it into the category, into the um, into the homotopy category of projected modules. So if you have a module here, you turn it into a complex of projected modules by a certain rule. That's the idea. And instead of computing the morphisms of modules and complexes of modules here, as you do, you first transfer them here and then compute the morphisms there. So that's the idea of derived category. Replace everything by image here, which is called projective resolution, and compute all the morphisms there. What's the result? The things that were isomorphic here will remain isomorphic there. But certain complexes which were not isomorphic here will become isomorphic there. So you lose equivalence classes. So they're joined together. There is less equivalent. There is more equivalence here than here. But when it comes to morphisms, you get more morphisms there than you have them there. So you get more morphisms and fewer equivalence classes. That's, that's the roughly, roughly speaking the result. So the, the experts did not stop me, so I think I said it correctly. <laughs> so how do you go this way? Quick and dirty. Suppose that you have a thing, which is called projective resolution of R, the ring itself, the algebra itself, as a module, as a left module, and the opposite right module over, over itself. So the, the algebra is the module over this, naturally. You can multiply on the left, you can multiply on the right. So suppose you can construct a complex of modules over this, which we call bimodules, a complex which starts at negative infinity and, adds, and ends at zero, with the following property. All the modules are projective modules of this thing, which means no relations, roughly speaking. Such that the homology of this complex is zero everywhere except at the head, where it is isomorphic to R as a bimodule. So suppose you can build this thing. Then, a projective re then how do you do a projective resolution? If you have a complex of modules here, so that all modules are projective, don't worry, just transfer them verbatim. Don't do anything. But if some modules in the complex are not projective, then tensor multiplied by this complex of by modules. You see, this is a module, so R acts here. This is a bimodule, R acts here and there. So you tensor over R on this and that side, but R acting here remains. So you get another module over R, but this one will be projected, or complex of projected modules. So attach something on the top, which remind the, reminds us of what we had previously. There we put projector, and now we'll be putting the resolution of the algebra. It's a bimodule. So, the K0 of this derived thing is generated freely by decomposable projectives. Because again, you take an object, which is a complex of modules, you turn it into a complex of projective modules. So count how many 
you get at which place with which penalty, and that's how you compute K0. Just read it off the projective resolution. Count how many modules, projective modules appear. But that assumes that you have finite resolution. Uh, yes, yes, there are some assumptions which you have to check. Which, so this is why it is so nice that, that I have certain bounds over there. These bounds come from the actual structure of projective resolution of HM that we construct from the infinite braid. Yes, because there, there is a problem. The resolutions often are infinite, so how do you add things up? It may be it, the K0 image doesn't have to be well defined. But in our case, it will be well defined. So, a derived category of bimodules. A bimodule, that's the left right module of R, is called suite. I borrowed this name from Misha's paper. I don't know if this is a. Did you invent it? It's bad technology. Well, it's here anyway. <laughs> so it's called suite. If it is projected separately as R module or as, as left module or as a right module. So it may not be projective as altogether. So there may be a relation between R acting on the left and R acting on the right. But if you forget about one of the actions, there is no relation then. So it's projective separately, but not necessarily together. So what is sweet about them? It's if you have a complex of those sweet modules, then its projective resolution over here, these are bimodules, can be achieved by tensoring with this thing on one side or on the other side. So this, this picture exactly reminds you of, of spherical Kaufman bracket. You take the tangle, the bimodule of the tangle, and put something on top or at the bottom. So this thing matches the projector. Okay. And finally, the notion of Hochschild homology of a complex of bimodules, quick and dirty. You take those bimodules, and you tensor them by this resolution. So you close this way and that way. Very simple. So, in other words, as soon as you get the resolution of HN, everything can be computed quickly. So, how do we deal it with HN? Remember that we turn tangles, mission turn tangles into complexes of modules over, of bimodules over HN. So first of all, you observe that there are lots of simple, simply looking projective, mo or projective modules over HN of topological, of topological nature. HN itself was a double sum over these closures. So let's fix the bottom crossingless matching, and let's take the sum over all the upper closings. Then this sum over beta is by definition the com the the module that you assign to this crossingless matching. So each n itself can be presented as a sum of modules assigned to all the 0 to n crossingless matchings. So therefore, all these modules, these sums, are projective. So that's the first, the easy observation. And then, Misha proves, this is not hard, that for temporal mid tangle, the corresponding bimodule is sweet. You can see it from this picture. So if you close it down and forget about it, then you get it. this. This thing is a crossingless matching. So from the point of view of the top, this is projected. So if you just close it at the bottom and forget about it, forget about this module structure, look at the top, then you get a thing like this. And if lambda, if temporal leave is split, then, of course, you get a projective bimodule. So if your temporal leap tangle is ordinary, then it's just sweet. But if it is split, then it's biprojective. So the resolution should be built out of biprojectives. Ah, we need a theorem that we borrow from Misha. The theorem says, that all in decomposable projectives are of this form. All in decomposable projection, projectives of HN, HM opposite are of this form. Therefore, the resolution of HN as a bimodule will be of this form. It will come from something universal. 
in Barnatons categorification, and it will contain only split split tangles. So at the end we will prove that K0, this resolution, is the projector PN0. And the reason is because the projector and the resolution both come from the infinite braid. This infinite torus braid yields its command of complex in the universal category yields this thing, and its Kalkin bracket is that. So categorification of the toy WRT. To a sphere with two and mark points, we associate the right category of ancient modules. That's the answer. To a tangle sitting here, what should we associate? So Misha associated to it a module over a complex of modules over HN. It has only upper ends, so it's a module over HN. But we are now in derived category rather than in category of complexes. But this makes no difference because <coughs> the the tangles participating in this complex are only crossing the smashings. So the complex that Mission gets is a complex of projectors. So it's already it's already in here where the resolutions live. So in terms of morphisms between the categorifications of those tangles, we do not we didn't change anything by going from complexes to this. Because we get complexes of projective modules anyway. So there is no difference at all. Now for just here, we associate derived the category of derived of derived category of modules over HN and HM, which is by the way equivalent to the product of categories. This equivalence comes from the fact that all the projectives are split tangles and split tangles split. So that's why this is the same as product of these two categories. So what do we associate to a tangle sitting inside S2 cross 7? <coughs> well, we associate the same as Misha did. No the bimodule over HN and HM, but now we place it in the derived category. So it's the same bimodule as Misha used, but originally, but now we place it in the derived category, which means, if, if we want to explain it at the pedestrian level, we use its projective resolution. And how do we get projective resolution? We put this complex on top of it. Tensoring with it is the same as connecting them. So, claim this map from here to here is well defined, which means that if we insert this thing inside tau, then nothing changes. So again, you use the fact that, well, this, this resolution can be moved through the upper piece of that tangle because they're all sweet, and then you move it up to the insertion of this tangle, of this braid, and this is categorification complex, so it comes from topology, so you can safely unwind. Well, no, I, I didn't put it correctly, you cannot safely unwind, you have to be careful, you can un unwind all the terms in the complex, but you have to verify that morphisms are not changed. So this requires some tricks, but it can be done. So just un unwind by using that it's split. <coughs> so this, the theorem is that this map from tangles to the derived category of bimodules categorifies the Kaufman bracket. K0 will take you there. And this should match the Kaufman bracket, and that's because the K0 of C is equal to the projection, as I promised. So what do you do with the link? If the link is a closure of a tangle, 
you turn this tangle into a bimodule and take its functional homology. And again, it's well defined because of the trace like of functional homology. And of course, this map goes through the previous map. So you may first place tau into the category associated to S2 cross a segment, which means you will place C on top of it, and then you will close. And this exactly matches the definition of functional homology. <coughs> so the theorem is that. This category finds this Jones, this whatever should be called the stable thing, meaning the Euler characteristic of this functional homology is equal to this. Again, one, one has to be careful because uh, Sasha remarked that the, the Euler characteristic doesn't have to be well defined, generally speaking. So the idea of the proof is. You use C plus. You see, let, let me see. So there is one trick involved. By definition, Habanov homology, uh, sorry, functional homology of this is the homology of this bimodule being tensored with this C thing. So generally speaking, if you tensor two tangles over the over both algebras, then you do not get anything nice. That was the problem with Mission's original construction. But in this case, we know that this is split. So tensoring with these can be done by tensoring with Hn over the top of it and tensoring with this over the bottom. In this pulling them, you have to be careful because the morphisms here may involve certain surfaces that join them, the settles. But settles split because of the Fortier relation. So when one can argue that all the morphisms in this category also split. So you pull them apart, put this on top, put this at the bottom, and then close them back into this picture. So here we are using the fact that this one is split to explain why functional homology is equal to simple closure of this. So finally, news is that here, so computing functional homology of an algebra like HN from first principles is a pretty hard thing. So there, there is this uh, universal bar construction which is huge. Or you should look at your algebra and guess how the resolution goes. And if the algebra is anything more complicated than CX1 X squared, good luck. So, but, thank God, here we have topology, which gives us at least something. So, in the last nine minutes, I'll talk about those torus braids in more detail. So, as, as I mentioned, uh, this, so let's first talk about torus braids, and why do they yield the projector in the, in temporal leap. So, Identity is presented as a sum of these projectors, as I mentioned. So let's compose both sides of this identity with this long torus braid. On the left, um, so on the left you get you will get this braid back. What will you get on the right? There is a theorem or fact that if you compose this projector with this long braid, then you acquire a power of Q. Everybody working with uh, Wittenrich Tick and Drive should know this factor. It's, the, it's what the framing does to a single line. So each term here acquires a factor, and those factors shoot up when n goes up, unless your m is equal to zero. So all the projectors after you twist. So you present an identity as a sum of projectors, then you put a twist, and all the projectors go up except the zero one, which stays at the bottom. So that's why this thing stabilizes, and what you see at the bottom is this projector. By the way, the fastest projector that moves up is the standard jones wenzel so you will see it at the top. So the thing is, ah, so if, if we understand. So Q is, say, 
No, it's 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 not a root of unity here. Okay, it's not yet. So you are talking about QA topology. Yes. And it will never be a root of unity here. So they so there is a space. Or it's a root of very high order. So therefore, this limit is this. So inserting this braid into the closure and <coughs> putting it on top of a tangle is as good as putting the projector. So now the categorical side of the story. We already know that the projective resolution of this braid is the same as the projective resolution of identity. Just by the existence of the resolution C, which will consist only of split tangles. And when you have split tangles, you can unwind. So therefore, you know right away that this and this as by modules in as by modules in the Dirac category are quasi-isomorphic, means equivalent in, in that category. But now we start working on the complex that represents this one, according to uh, Kovanov, in the category of complexes, not in the derived ones. And, with, after some work, you prove that if you take a single twist, then there exists a complex, so you start with the standard Kovanov complex and do some simplifications, there exists a complex, such that the last two terms are split. So this, this requires some calculation and good luck. Then you can argue that if you do it n times, then you will have two n terms split. Because the end and the ones that are already split are stable. Because if you put an extra twist on top of it, you do not change this part. And when you put it on top of the remaining parts of the complex, you use the fact that it has two pieces split, so you gain two extra splits. So each time you put an extra twist, you get two more splits. And the previous ones remain stable. So since, these, since the closure of these is by projective, and the whole thing, since the closure of these is by projected, the whole thing stabilizes and is quasi-isomorphic to identity, you deduce that this is exactly the complex C dot. So finally, you do experimental work. Ah. So now, you can compute the Hochschild homology of the algebra itself. By definition, it's the result of closing this thing, the identity <coughs> braid. And you can do it topologically by putting this braid. So indeed, the Hochschild homology of HN is nothing but Kavanov homology of a torus link. So this is the generalization of the observation of Joseph Pschitinsky, which was made five years ago. And Marco Stasich immediately proved the st stabilization for, for this end. So this end of the complex represents the Hochschild homology of HN. So then you download Barnaton and his students. Actually, there was a particular name. I should have written this down. But Jeremy Green. Sorry? Jeremy Green. And, uh, and you also participated in this project. So we should uh, thank you for this. It's a, it's a wonderful program. You type in the brief, you, you get the best computer that you have at home. Uh, and you look at this and try to guess what is... <coughs> you see, Hochschild cohomology is... Since HN is Frobenius, then Hochschild cohomology is the same as Hochschild homology up to a shift in degrees. Hochschild cohomology, by the way, should have a has a commutative algebra, supercommutative algebra structure. So you should guess the algebra, the algebra, commutative algebra structure on quantum homology that is spit out by the program. Uh, I, I will show you the result of the guess. Of course, you, you need some extra considerations to guess it. You, you use the paper of Misha where he explains how if you have a cable, this is a cable, then 
you should expect that it splits, at least in terms of dimensions, into the contributions of individual irreducibles. Uh, spin 0, spin um, 1, spin 2, and so on. So you, so you, you do some... Uh, you, first you go from cable to individual spins by taking alternating sums of these things, and then you see something simple, and then you conjecture the whole thing, because if you just look at the homology of this braid, it will be hard to recognize what I'm going to show you. So the conjecture of, of this algebra structure is this. Uh, so you have variables x of degree 2 and 0 homological degree. So these reproduce the structure of 10 string d2 with itself. And they go under the... So there will be a quotient. The relation between them is that the sum of squares and the total sum is zero. If you take Q of X quotiented by this, it will have those Catalan numbers. Oh, it, it will look like the expansion of V2 tends for 2N, the multiplicities of irreducibles in V2 tends for 2N. And then there are more variables. The variables, call them A and theta. These are these are even and these are odd for Smanian. These are the degrees. And the restriction is that A's and thetas kill polynomials of X of, uh, of sufficiently high degree. So it's almost free algebra on A's and thetas and with uh, some X's. So you th the bracket, it should, since it's social homology, it should have this bracket, uh, first cover bracket. Well, you see those A's and thetas come in pairs. It looks like coordinate and, uh, and vector field. Or in social homology, it should correspond to cyclic differential. But the, the actual expressions that you may try to get in case of in case of H equal to 1, we can compute this exactly, of course, and, uh, because H1 is Cx mod x squared. And the actual expressions for the sex for structures is, is not, not exactly true. Well, but nevertheless, this is what you get. So it's a torus, so apparently torus grade, in that sense, categorifies the lowest projector. Uh, but in order to make it into a full, full rigorous theorem, we have to explain what are the other projectors. not stable, but you should try to... I, I think other projectors... Um, so this, this height, you see, what, what goes on is that the braid of very high twist separates all the projectors. Each goes up by its own power of Q. So the easiest thing to do is to look at the top and at the bottom you will see the highest and the lowest immediately. But you may also try to get other ones by subtracting from top or from bottom. So if you know exactly the stable part all the way and subtract from this one, then you may expect that the difference will also stabilize. So you may play with it uh, for so there will be some strips which are moving up. Uh, there, there are no strips. These are just numbers here. Here in this picture, there are just numbers. The, this is the result of yeah, the flow. Yes, yes, the, the, this part, yes, the second one will move up, so you will have to uh, renormalize. So I think, so I think that if you, if you take this one for high n, and then subtract the exact, say, formula for, for this when n is infinite, then the stable part will cancel, because it's the same. And then, starting from somewhere, you will start getting numbers, 
and then you send this n, this finite n, you increase it, and maybe those numbers here will also start stabilizing, and that will represent the second, the projector 2n comma 2. In the same, you can play, but... So, this actual parallelogram, by the way, reflects the, the complex for the braid. So the complex for the braid lies exactly within this parallelogram. So, and the tangle adds the cloudiness or closure. The complex of the braid is, I think, yeah, it sits, it sits exactly there. Yes, I think just, so first of all, there were re results by Pshatitsky and um, Marcus Tosic. Uh, by the way, I should also mention the work of uh, Ben Cooper and Slava Krushkal, who categorified by looking at uh, Misha and Frankel's, um, in your Frankel's formula, categorified the, uh, the highest, the highest Jones Wenzel. So they did it by looking at Misha and uh, Igor, and I did it just from the braid. Um, so this, this refers to this corner. Um, and this, I, think, I think that what you get from this for the braid should match uh, what Marco uh, Stasich did for Taurus Links. she explained to me yesterday was that the sutured uh, homolo quadratic homology of a tangle would correspond to putting Jones Wenzel projector on top of it, the highest one. Uh, so yeah, I'll have to talk to her to understand the, what goes on there. It's, uh, yeah, it's very interesting to compare. Yes. So how far it can be generalized? So if, for example, you wanted to replace S2 cross S1 by a chain of G circles times S1? Oh, uh, it's, it's very hard. We thought, we thought about it, we would be very, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty hard. Uh, yeah, but can it be done? Look, there are, there are some, some, are there some reasons why it can't be done at all with just a car? Well, it, it, it's not stable. So if you put, if you put a genus, then, then it's, it's not stable. But yeah, we, we plan we plan to think more and we plan to think hard. Right. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a natural thing. To, yes. But by stable, that that was a condition on your first slide. Yes, I mean, so if you have endpoints on a sphere carrying two-dimensional representation, then the corresponding space is the same as soon as R is greater than two n or something like that. But if you have a torus, for example, even an empty torus, then the the space grows proportional to R, even for an empty torus. So you have to incorporate this somehow. So it's, it's a very challenging, yes, it's, it's the grail. <laughs> so th this was the only thing you can grab, um, just based on what Misha did, without uh, big new input. So if I Yes. Is, it, is there sort of any sort of analogous um, statement about? Um, yeah, there, there should be. Oh uh, yes, yes, there there should be. Uh, uh, the, the, I'll have to. The, there should be definitely something simple. I just I'll just have to think. So the, the Euler characteristic of this thing is well defined because 
this because of the boundedness of this. So at every, for example, at every particular power of Q, what, what's the what's the problem with computing Euler characteristic of such things? Uh, you take the particular power of Q, which means vertical line, and generally speaking, if, if you go very high in homology and you take a limit, there is no bound, generally speaking, if you just fancy something. But here you know that there will be no homology beyond this point, so therefore the Euler characteristic is well defined. By the way, uh, a, 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 fun, a funny comment. Uh, I mentioned uh, two braids that establish equivalence uh, when you consider tangles in S2 plus S1. So one is one strand going around, and the other is a 360 twist. 360 twist is almost immaterial. Its square will be covered by single braid move. And their meaning is different. The single braid, the single um, strand move, is related to isotopy. So you can, um, so it's it's the equivalence for the is ambient isotopy class of tangles in S2 process one. Whereas the 360 rotation is not the isotopy, but homeomorphism classification of tangles. There is a distinction between isotopy up to ambient isotopy and up to ambient homeomorphism related to the fact that S2, that S2 cross the segment, I'm sorry, ambient segment, the same goes to S1, has a non-trivial mapping, relative mapping class group. So if you, have, if you consider homeomorphisms of S2 cross segment into itself, which do not move the boundary, the group is Z2. It's, it's related to pi 1 of SO3. And, uh, and this element, which does the mapping class group, its action on the, its action on the category should, should represent a function, an equivalence function. It's not identity. So well, one should be careful. Uh, what we established is that the, is, is essentially the equivalence, but how it acts, it, it may introduce minus one somewhere. So they, they, they play different roles. We, we're not used to this at this level. We're used to the fact that mapping class group acts, for example, in space associated to torus, or in space associated to surface with handles in which we're sticking to arrive. But this is a theory one dimension up. So here you have to be careful about, about mapping class group acting on three dimensional uh, things. So it will act, it will act by uh, by um, functors here. Other questions?